Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash CanadaEHX. You can also donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking donate. Don't forget, I have two other podcasts out there, Pucks and Cups and From John to Justin, available on all podcast platforms. This episode is sponsored by the City of Leduc. Today I'm going to be looking at the community of Leduc located just outside of Edmonton. It's a really great community with a really interesting history. And as usual, I won't be going through a chronological list of things that happened in the community, but more looking at stories that are interesting. So let's begin. The Indigenous For centuries, the land that would be Leduc was occupied by the Indigenous, specifically the Blackfoot and the Stony, who hunted the bison that would make its way up from the south. As Europeans and Canadians began to push in from the east in the early 1800s, the Cree and the Métis would move into the area. The industry that would come to dominate Leduc and Alberta, oil, would also be used by the indigenous of the area. For centuries, the indigenous knew about oil and they would use it as pitch for their canoes and sometimes as a medicinal ointment. The history of the indigenous is found in eight locations in the area that are recognized by the Archaeological Survey of Alberta. Archaeological digs within the area have dated the indigenous living around what would be Leduc for upwards of 4,000 to 10,000 years. Currently, Leduc sits on Treaty 6 land. The Founding of the Community In 1899, Leduc was established by Robert Telford, a settler and future Alberta politician, who came to the area and bought land near what is now called Telford Lake. Not only is he considered to be the first settler for Leduc, but he is also the first postmaster, the first general merchant, and the first justice of the peace. Telford would actually have a huge impact on the area, also assisting the dozens and even hundreds who came to the area with helping them find their land, but he would also help in other ways, which I'll get to later. The area would see its first boom when the Calgary and Edmonton Railway was built through the region in 1891, with the first train arriving on July 9, 1891. According to those who were there, the event was not met with much fanfare and only a few people were on the platform. As for the name, there are two versions where it comes from. The first is that it was named in April of 1886 by a settler who was setting up a telegraph office, and he needed to name the station. He chose to name the station after the first person who came through the door. That person happened to be Father Hippolyte Ledoux, a priest who had been in the area since 1867. The other story of its naming comes from Father Lacombe, who provided a list of names to Edgar Dudney in 1891, who was the lieutenant governor of the Northwest Territories at the time. On the list was the name of Father Ledoux, and since the telegraph station was already named Ledoux or Leduc, it was decided that the name of the new community would be Leduc. So in a way, both stories are right. In 1899, Leduc had grown to be a village and was a town by 1906. For the next few decades, the community grew slowly, but all of that would change on February 13, 1947, when an oil strike occurred nearby that would change Leduc, Alberta, and Canada forever. Leduc number 1 In 1936, the first major crude oil discovery would happen in Turner Valley at a depth of 2 kilometers, the deepest well in Alberta at the time. By 1942, the oil field reached its peak production of 10 million barrels and had the distinction of being the largest oil field in all of the British Empire. There was also an oil discovery in 1914 in Turner Valley, and this would result in oil companies spending $150 million, or $2.2 billion today, over the course of 30 years trying to find oil. No major reserves were found and the provincial government was forced to start issuing tax relief for oil companies to encourage further exploration. After that strike in 1936, oil companies flooded into Alberta looking for crude. One company was Imperial Oil, who drilled 133 wells with no success. 
The geologists who worked for the company believed that greater reserves could be found at deeper depths, and they convinced the company to do one more drilling effort. The board of directors agreed, and Wildcat number 134 was drilled as a last-ditch effort. The company purchased 200,000 acres of land southwest of Edmonton and began to survey the best area to drill. They came up with two candidate areas. One was near Pigeon Lake, while the other was near Leduc. The team chose Leduc because it was closer to major roadways, and this was a good decision because the Pigeon Lake well was later dug and proved to be dry. On the farmstead of Mike Turda, a drilling site was chosen. Turda did not have the drilling rights, so Imperial Oil paid him $250 to lease his land, or $3,500 today. This well would be the only one within 80 kilometers and would be dug to a depth of 2,100 meters. Drilling would begin on November 20, 1946, but only small traces of oil and natural gas were found going down to 1,200 meters. Drilling would pass the Mesozoic depth, and indications were that there was a large quantity of natural gas and a bit of oil. When drilling past the Paleozoic era and into the Devonian era, tests showed promising results at 1,500 meters. On February 3, 1947, a test sent a geyser of oil shooting up halfway past the drilling derrick. With that, Imperial Oil knew that there was oil to be found at this location. Vern Hunter, the lead of the drilling team, was asked by the company when they expected him to hit pay dirt with the well. He would say, quote, The crew and I were experts at abandoning wells, but we didn't know much about completing them. I named February 13th and started praying. By the morning of February 13th, we hadn't started a swab, and that operation sometimes takes days. However, we crossed our fingers and at daylight started in. End quote. Shortly after 4 p.m., the wellhead was cleared, and the 500 people who had gathered and braved the cold saw Leduc No. 1 spray oil into the air. The youngest member of the drilling crew was given the honor of flaring the well. We heard that noise last Friday as Imperial Leduc 230 blew in. We've heard wells blowing in over 300 times in this Leduc field, and it's always a welcome sound. Because for the young drilling company, it means we've finished another job. You see, in this field, oil field here in the farmlands of Alberta, we drill about a mile straight down to reach the oil pool. From the day we spud in or start drilling, it takes on the average of about 30 days to finish the job. The oil flows into storage tanks, and we move the rig to another location. We're on a new location now, in the middle of the Luke oil field. While we are drilling, we pump in a circulating fluid of mud that brings up the cuttings of rock from the drill bit. Right now, I'm standing in my tool pusher's shack, it, and it's just a few feet away from the drilling rig. It's 15 below this morning. That's 47 degrees of frost. There's about a foot of snow and a northwest wind. The sun won't be up for another hour yet, but we don't work by the sun here. Once we start drilling, we work 24 hours a day, every day, including Sundays and holidays. It's a tough job working outside in the winter with the cold and the snow, but if we stopped, all our fluid lines would freeze up and there'd be all sorts of trouble. We have all learned to take the bad with the good, and all of us like the oil field. So even though it's Christmas Day, the graveyard shift is out there drilling. 90 feet up in the derrick on the monkey board is the derrick man, while out on the rig platform, the driller and his three helpers are hustling to keep the hole moving down to that pool of oil. But we're not forgetting about Christmas. As soon as we're off shift, we'll be rushing home to our wives and kitties. The discovery was huge for Canada. At the time, the country only produced about 21,000 barrels per day, and most of that came from Turner Valley. In contrast, the country was consuming about 210,000 barrels a day. In Alberta, production was 7.7 .7 million barrels per year from 416 wells, and 90% of the oil needed by Canada was being imported from the United States. The discovery would lead to a huge increase in the estimates of how much oil was actually in Western Canada. In 1946, it was believed that there were 72 million recoverable barrels of oil in Western Canada. By 1957, that estimate had been increased to 3 billion, and today it's believed there are 77 billion barrels of oil in conventional reserves in Western Canada. Harvest. 
fine, full sheaves, fields of golden grain ready to harvest, the harvest which has been our living since we began to farm this land. This is good earth. We've lived by it since we helped to clear and level it years ago. And now it's a good heritage for our children. Not an easy life, but one full of rewarding labor and satisfaction. Our little market town of Luke isn't far away. It's a quiet place. We go there to shop, get our machinery fixed, buy gas and oil, and to talk things over with the neighbors. As soon as that first well blew in, things began to happen. Overnight, the roads were filled with traffic, oil workers, and trucks carrying pipe. <laughs> I never saw so much pipe. And the landscape was changing. New derricks went up all around. Night and day, good weather and bad, the work pressed forward. With more wells blowing in, the importance of the discovery was recognized. And the swell, the flow of oil, came a flow of investors' money to pay the cost of more and more drilling. Quickly, the flow is turned into the mud sump. The signs of the new crop are all around. Services are expanding. New houses are mushrooming on the outer lots. Nice ones, too. Lots of fellows plying their trades more busily than they have in many a day. The change of pace doesn't show quite as much out our way, but it's there. For instance, we run our machinery and our automobiles cheaper than we used to. A man's harvest hasn't changed, and yet the land he's known and worked is suddenly touched with mystery. Farmer and oil man, grain and crude oil. Two crops where there was one. It's strange and wonderful, this reaping of another harvest, rich and powerful, a mile below the wheat. Leduc No. 1 would operate for the next three decades until 1974. By that point, it had produced 317,000 barrels of oil and 323 million cubic feet of natural gas. Today, the Leduc No. 1 and Leduc Woodland Oil Field are designated as a National Historic Site, and the Leduc No. 1 Energy Discovery Center opened in 1997 to feature exhibits about the oil industry, as well as artifacts and equipment from those early days. I'd like to take a break away from the episode for a second to talk about ExploreNet. I spent most of my life living in rural areas in Canada, and I remember the days of dial-up internet and spotty high-speed service. For the past three years, I have been a customer of ExploreNet, and I can honestly say that it is the best rural internet I have ever had. My job as a podcaster means I spend a lot of time researching online, interviewing people over Zoom, and uploading content. Through it all, ExploreNet has provided me with excellent service. When I'm not working, I enjoy streaming content on several streaming platforms, and even doing some online gaming with a friend in Ontario. ExploreNet allows me to do all of that with ease. Right now, they offer up to 50 megabits per second on their new LTE network with unlimited data. Their service has only become faster and better since I first signed on. Today and beyond, ExploreNet is investing in building and upgrading the network at a rapid pace. ExploreNet is rural, and that is their route, and that is their focus. For more information about rural internet options in your area, go to ExploreNet.com or call one 866 285-2253. The Dr. Woods House Museum One of the more interesting places to visit in Leduc is the home that celebrates the first doctor to work within the area. Robert Woods was born in 1870 in London, Ontario, and after graduating from Western University, practiced medicine in Kansas until 1902. It was in that year he moved to the Leduc district and homesteaded in the Telfordville area. Not only working as a doctor, he also served as a veterinarian. In 1905, he wanted to open up a medical practice, but he needed a license. 
and through the help of his friend, MLA Robert Telford, he was able to get his license thanks to the settlers from as far away as Kalmar, who agreed to pay him $2 a year for his service. Early in 1908, a private member's bill in the legislature was sponsored by Telford to allow Woods to practice medicine. Later that year, he moved into Leduc to open up his practice. The wife of Dr. Woods, Olive McGregor, actually rode in on one of the first trains to arrive in Leduc, and according to Olive, she and Robert were married the day she arrived. As a doctor, he was an advocate for cleanliness, and he would travel many kilometers, day or night, in all conditions to help his patients. He was a common sight during the winter when he was wearing his buffalo coat with fur gloves, visiting patients. When the Spanish flu hit, he would work day and night to help patients deal with a deadly disease. More often than not, patients could not pay their bill to Dr. Woods, and he would accept chickens, butter, eggs, potatoes, and milk for his services. In 1923, he was granted a certificate from the Medical Council of Canada, allowing him to practice medicine anywhere in Canada. In Leduc, Dr. Woods would serve on town council, along with being the medical health officer and coroner for the town. He would pass away on April 22, 1936. After his death, the home was sold by his wife and it went through four owners until 1982 when the city of Leduc bought it. One of those owners was MLA Ronald Ansley, who spearheaded a revolt against Alberta Premier William Aberhart during the 1930s. It was then renovated and turned into a museum by the city. In 1993, the Dr. Woods House Museum was designated as an Alberta Registered Historic Site, and in 2008, an Alberta Municipal Historic Site. The museum depicts the domestic and professional life of Dr. Woods, including through the use of artifacts and exhibits that outline life in the area from the 1920s until the 1940s. The Stone Barn and Cultural Village For another dose of history from the past of Leduc, you can visit the Stone Barn and Cultural Village, which contains an original farmhouse, a milking shed, fully landscaped gardens, and the historic Stone Barn. The barn serves as a representation of the original dairy barn that existed on that spot. The building itself is stone with wood beams, but along with the rest of the building it gives you a glimpse into the past of Leduc and the many industries that called it home. If you're looking to just enjoy a nice day outside, you can sit at the many picnic tables in the park or explore the gardens. And due to the history and unique architecture of the area, the park and the barn are very popular for weddings. The Leduc Heritage Grain Elevator There was a time when grain elevators, or prairie sentinels, stood all across the western landscape of Canada. Of course, most are long gone now, but some communities like Leduc preserve their heritage through grain elevators. In the community, this is done through the Leduc Heritage Grain Elevator Site Complex. Built in 1978, the elevator serves as one of the last composite wood crib elevators constructed in Alberta. At the time of its construction, it was a transitional period between the building of wood crib grain elevators and more widespread building of concrete and steel grain terminals. The elevator built in Leduc was one of the last built in Alberta that had a traditional structure with contemporary mechanisms. The site also serves as a good representation of similar elevator complexes for this period in Western Canada. On January 20, 2003, it was recognized as a provincial historic site. Today, the complex is open for tours throughout the year, so you can learn more about not only the grain elevator history of Leduc, but the agricultural history of the region, which served as the dominant industry until the arrival of oil. Flight 3801 It was on a cold winter day as a blizzard raged in the Leduc area in 1973 when a tragic event would occur. In the entire history of the Edmonton International Airport dating back to 1960, there has only been one instance of a fatal plane crash, and this was it. On January 2, 1973 at 8.30am, Flight 3801, a Pacific Western's Airlines Boeing 707 cargo jet, was approaching the runway of the airport, carrying five crew members and 86 head of cattle. The plane had left Toronto en route to South Korea with a stop in Edmonton. The first officer had just been promoted to Boeing 707 operations, and he was assigned to take the approach. 
The first officer was taking his first approach after a six-week holiday, and with the factor of fatigue, turbulent air, and a heavy-loaded aircraft, the approach was extremely difficult. As the plane approached, it hit poplar trees roughly 3,000 meters short of the runway. The plane then struck the ground with a glancing blow, and the tail fin struck power lines. The plane then struck a large ridge in the middle of a gravel pit, causing the cockpit section and part of the fuselage to break away, which resulted in the cargo and 86 cattle shooting forward through the open section of the fuselage for a distance of 100 meters. A fire then erupted in the plane. All five crew members, along with the cattle, were killed in the crash. Parts of the wreckage are on display at the Alberta Aviation Museum in Edmonton, and four decades later, pieces of the crash are still being found in the area. Notable Residents George Rogers was born in Jamaica on September 14, 1958, and he would come to Canada as a young man in 1975. After graduating from Leduc Senior High School in 1977 and then the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology in 1980, he would go on to receive a certificate in local government studies from the University of Alberta in 1988. After time working in the oil industry, he would return to Leduc in 1992 to start a real estate sales career. That same year, he was elected to city council and then again in 1995. In 1998, he was elected the mayor of Leduc and he would be re-elected in 2001. In 2004, he was elected to his first term in the Alberta Legislature, and he would be re-elected in 2008 and 2012. In his role as MLA, he also served as the Deputy Speaker of the Legislature from 2012 to 2015. A few times this episode, I've mentioned Robert Telford, and I want to go into a bit more detail about this interesting man. He was born in Shawville, Quebec on June 19, 1860, and he would come west looking for adventure. That sense of adventure would push him to join the Northwest Mounted Police, where he served during the Northwest Rebellion of 1885. After some time in Calgary, he came to Leduc and built a house, which was then the largest house between Edmonton and Calgary. In 1890, he married Belle Howard, and they would go on to have two sons, one of which, Raymond, was killed in June of 1916 during the First World War. In 1905, Telford was elected to the Alberta Legislature in the first election in Alberta's history, and was re-elected by acclamation in 1909. After he lost his bid for re-election in 1913, he would serve on town council for several years and as mayor of Leduc from 1915 to 1916. In 1919, he retired and continued to live in the Leduc area. He would die in 1933 at the age of 73. Telford Lake and Telford Ville are named for him. I hope you enjoyed that episode of my look at the city of Leduc. If you did please leave a rating and review. If you like, you can reach me through email at craig at canadaehx.com. You can also visit my website where you'll find hundreds of articles on Canada's history as well as all my podcast episodes. Just go to canadaehx.com. And don't forget, you can support the podcast through Patreon. There are multiple tiers to choose from, all with great benefits. You can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month, just like all of these wonderful patrons have, and I apologize if I mispronounce any names. Randy McCallum, Diane Wade, Laurie Ann Kirby, Gary Dolovich, Nick Zinri, Pamela Elder, Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Shove, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Roa, Luke S., J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, and Iris Gray. If you want, you can find me on Facebook. Just go to facebook.com slash CanadianHistoryX. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D. And you can find me on Instagram. Just go to Bairdo37. Thanks. We'll see you again next time.